it. Okay. Uh, and Linda, that fan, that's going to be the way it is, huh? Yeah, yeah okay. I got it off, but it's <laughs> Okay. We're, we're ready. There might be a... Have a look at that switch. There's an on-off. Yeah, I turned it off, so it's hoping. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Apparently we don't have full control no. in here. Anyway, so we're rolling. Uh -huh. Mr. Bacall, welcome back to Dallas. Thank you. I saw you and actually even talked with you when you were here before. And uh, I have to tell you that Fiddler on the Roof, if I had to name my five favorite musicals of all time, Fiddler would be right in there in the top five. Yes, I, it, it is one of the finest. Uh, it, it's the best crafted musical. It's, it's also, and it has heart. It's, it's really quite wonderful. To me, the, from the very first time I saw it, what impressed me was that I don't have the Jewish background or even the European background, but it's about any family of any generation. But the greatness of, of, of great art is precisely that, that it, 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 it gets to be accessible to everybody. You do not have to be of the time of the period, let, let's face it, this place set in 1905 in Eastern Europe, in Russia, and the conflict is between Jews and Russians, but, that, but that's just the, the canvas on which it is painted. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a story that, that, that takes hold of you, you connect with it, you find parallels. And having children, and they get to a certain age, and they go in all directions, right. and in the end, the family is going in all directions. And that's right. It, it's, it's, it's about tradition, about the breaking down of tradition, about how to keep it uh, going, how to attempt to keep it going. And, uh, uh, and the wonderful thing about this particular play is that it, it switches from, from hilarious comedy to pathos in a split second. And the musical numbers, every single one is mm. a wonderful number. Yeah. And that, you know, musical theater is, is something that is uniquely American. And, uh, I mean, they used to have music and theater in, in Europe, and it was called operetta. But operetta was quite different. There was action, and then the action stopped, and somebody faced the audience and sang a song, and then the action resumed. In musical theater, the, the songs propel the action forward, take out the mu musical numbers, and you have a hole in the action. And that's different. Has anyone performed Tevya more times than yourself? I don't think so, no. You have had close to 1,700 performances, yes, that's right. I understand. Is there any one performance that stands out either because of the place or the time or something that happened? Uh, yes, I guess that there are, obviously, there are times when, when when you find um, that the circumstances are trying. We, we performed in, in a tent, for example, in Massachusetts, and there was a downpour, uh, an incredible weather, and we had to stop and start and stop and start, and finally, in the middle of the second act, it became impossible to continue, and um, even the orchestra pit was filling with water, and I waved everybody off the stage, and I grabbed the microphone from one of the musicians, and proceeded to tell the audience the rest of the story, singing all the songs by myself without accompaniment. Nobody left. <laughs> People even wrote me a lot of letters after that. <laughs> it's too bad that wasn't filmed in its entirety. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. You have a Russian Jewish background. Yes. Uh, your parents came, yeah. did they, from Europe? My grandparents came, yes. My, my, my parents did too. My parents came from a place that changed hands a lot. When they were born, it was Austria, then it became uh, Romania, then it became Russia. It's now Ukraine. Were there any Tevias in your family? My grandfather. My grandfather was very much a Tevia. He was in the midst of, uh, beset by poverty, in the midst of a very hostile environment, and, uh, and managed, and managed, managed to live, to to survive. 
So obviously you remember your grandfather yeah, quite I do. well. I do. Um, he died, uh, let me see, when I was uh, 11. And, uh, and I used to go visit in, in the summer. And uh, I, I remember him quite well. He w lived on a farm, did he? No, he no. lived in a, in a city and in, in, in he ran a small inn. Oh. Yeah. Which so. he really allowed his wife to run. He was more interested in reading books, studying. And she was a Golda? No. No. She was my step-grandmother, and I don't remember very little about her. Did you ever see the movie version of Fiddler on the Roof? Only bits and pieces. I never saw the entire movie, no. No, I <coughs> it seemed to me that the widescreen didn't do the, uh, the story too much justice because this is a very contained, small village feeling and a small community feeling, and you put it on a widescreen, it suddenly becomes something else. And, you know, the, the Russians come in, and instead of, a, of, a, of, a, of an incident of bashing heads, it becomes war and peace. The casting of that was uh, unusual, I thought, in some ways, because uh, Zero Mostel had done it on Broadway. Was he even considered for the no. movie? He was not. was not, no. Nor was I, and I had already done the role by the time the movie was shot. Uh, yeah, I guess they wanted to be kingmakers. And Topol, had, had he ever done it? He had done, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Whether he had done it, but then, but they probably had. Of course, you worked with Norman Jewison. Oh yes. Times and after that, didn't sure. you? Yes. And before I would worked with him, the Russians are coming was done before I did it every year. What do you remember about the Russians are coming? The Russians are coming. Oh, that was such a wonderful thing to work on. We were in Northern California for weeks and weeks on end, and thrown to our own uh, our own devices, and we had these great people in the cast, uh, Jonathan Winters, Tessie O'Shea, uh, Carl Reiner, Alan Arkin, and we used to do um, the fab most fabulous parties, and sometimes we threw them open to the local populace and uh, just gave a show that they could, would have never been able to afford <laughs> if they had to buy tickets. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, you were in the African Queen. Yes. And what do you remember about Bogart and Catherine Hepburn? Well, I played a lot of chess with Bogart, at the time, and uh, he was much better than I. He beat me a lot. And uh, she was uh, very much the New England lady, but she was very warm and very, uh, uh, you know, very polite at all times. She's the most, one of the most polite people I've ever met in, in, uh, in my profession. And uh, I used to play the guitar for them when, when they were, we had these long pauses while they were setting up the, the next shot. In fact, I have a picture of my playing the guitar in costume for Bogart, Hepburn, and John Houston. How was Houston to work for as a director? Oh, he was impish. He had a sense of humor. He was a, um, a, a practical joker who would um, play jokes on everybody. And, uh, and I find him delightful. Great, great sense of humor. And he was doing a lot of hunting while he was there, wasn't he? Well, he, uh, that was in Africa. My, my, the entirety of my role was shot on the back lot in, in, in England. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> they had already been to Africa by the time we got to do um, my stuff. And uh, I understand he, he did a lot of hunting, but then he did that every, everywhere in Ireland where he lived. Yes, it was riding to the, the hounds and the fox. Yeah. <laughs> Then uh, the Defiant Ones with Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier. That was amazing. Uh, uh, Stanley Kramer, who died recently, um, called me in and, and asked me to play this uh, Southern Sheriff. And I said, I'm very flattered, uh, but um, I'm also puzzled. I said, uh, I'm not a Southerner. I wasn't even born here. Why are you offering me this role? And he said, a good actor is a good actor is a good actor. And it's a dictum that people have forgotten over the years. Nowadays, they insist that you, you be what you act instead of act what you know how to act. And uh, I guess it turned out that he was right. 
because not only did I play the role, but I, I, I played a Southern Sheriff and I got an Academy Award nomination for doing it. And so it proved something. That uh, you are a voting member of the Academy, are oh you yeah, not? Oh, yes. What do you think is going to win Best Picture this year? I mean, we're not allowed to say. We're not to say how we vote. No, but uh, I mean, it, yeah. what does it look like yeah. to you at uh, this point? Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting, but the Chinese picture may, may win. Uh, yeah. That is an extraordinary yeah, film. Yeah, it is an extraordinary film. Uh, the only reason why it might not is because it's nominated in two categories, both as best film and best foreign film. So some people might think, okay, we'll give it best foreign and, and, and vote for Gladiator instead. Uh, I, um, they, I'm usually quite certain about, about things, but this year that there's such a good crop of, of films and it, it, it's difficult, difficult to say. Chocolat was a delightful film, and so, you know. Uh, for my personal uh, assessment of it, though, I thought Chocolat was wonderful, but I was kind of surprised it got a nomination for Best Picture. I think it was the Miramax machine that worked. <laughs> well, I don't know that that machine really, uh, once the nominations are out, the machine goes into gear. <coughs> Before that, uh, you know, the Academy members really vote, vote pref personal preferences without even looking too much at, at, at anybody um, or over anybody's shoulder or their, their own. Um, yeah, sure, Chocolat is, is, is a delightful film and it's also, as, as is its title, a confection. Yes. Do you think there's anything to this theory that some people hold, and I, I'm, when I say some people, I mean critics, that the members who are based in New York tend to vote a little differently than the members who are based in L.A.? I'm sure that that's, that's true. I'm sure that is true. Because people who live in New York have a different attitude uh, toward uh, art in general and the performing arts in particular than do the people in, in Hollywood. People in Hollywood go uh, march to a different drummer. You made a movie with Clark Gable. What do you remember about that? <laughs> Never Let Me Go. That, that, that was the title of the, of, the, of the movie. Well, I remember that we would sit at lunch and he would talk about things that I knew absolutely nothing about. He uh, had collection of automobiles that he would take apart and put together again and he could wax lyrical about automobile parts. At the time I didn't even own a car, let alone know what the inside of a car was like or what, what it did or what the parts did, but he was, uh, I mean, he talked about it the, the way other people talked about sex. <laughs> Cable described that way, but I love it. <laughs> what about you doing some movies? Of course, you're so tied to Tevye in this tour, but what about Yeah, but well, obviously I do, I walk away from, from Tevye and do other things. I, uh, last year I did two other plays, um, two of them in Miami and one of them in New York, and uh, you know, I do that, and, and if a good movie comes along, I'll do that too. Uh, I have two homes. My main home is in Connecticut. The other one's in Los Angeles. I, I'm ready and able and willing to do anything that comes along. The only thing I'm not able or willing to do is not do anything. I couldn't agree with you more on that. That's probably a good place for us to stop. <laughs> and thank you so much, thank Mr. Patel. It is a delight to have you back in thank Dallas. You. Thanks. Great. Okay, now we'll just start to answer a little bit, and then I'll yeah. wave you off. Excuse me? Oh, thanks. It doesn't want to do what. You ready? You want white balance again? Okay. Mr. Bakel, has anyone played Tevya more times than yourself? Uh, as far as I know, nobody has. No, no. That's good. Okay. Um,
What is the most unusual performance you have ever given of Fiddler on the Roof? Well, several of them. One of them was the 4th of July where the fireworks went off. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of the performance. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where was that? Valley Forge. Oh, how, how appropriate. <laughs> okay. You okay, Linda? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Are there any Tevyas in your family? Yes, my grandfather. That's who I'm playing. I, I, I sort of, um, one models uh, roles after whatever, what one knows. It's not always easy because if you play a murderer or a king, it doesn't work. But uh, if you do a role like this, yes, you can. And was he a farmer? No, he lived in a city. He ran an inn, a small inn. Okay, all right. Um, did you ever see the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Only bits and pieces, more. And what did you think? Well, the widescreen didn't, uh, in my opinion, do it uh, justice. Uh, it, um, it needs a con the containment of, and the smallness. Okay. You're a voting member of the Academy of Motion Picture. You're a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Do you have any idea which picture could win this year? We're not allowed to say. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, uh, maybe the Chinese picture will get there. Yeah. Didn't Life is Beautiful was in two categories and, and one best picture? That's yeah. correct, yes. Benini's yeah. picture, yeah. 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 Funny little man, Benini. Okay, all right, now just a few things. <clears throat> what do you remember about making the African Queen? I remember playing chess with Bogey. I remember uh, playing the guitar for Bogart, Hepburn, John Huston. Okay. What recollections do you have of Clark Gable? Loved his automobiles, adored cars. I've never heard that before. That's <laughs> very interesting. I've never read that either. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Oh, I didn't ask you about the pride. No, okay. The Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. What do you think of when you think of that movie? Well, it was the m most uh, wonderful conglomeration of, of talented people that were thrown together in an isolated spot. I didn't ask you this on camera, but let me try it now. The Pride and the Passion, Frank Sinatra, Cary Grant, Sophia Loren, what comes to mind? A cannon. A cannon? That's what it was about. It was all about uh, recovering or, or reconquering a, a cannon that was being shifted from place to place and hidden in, in lofts and in churches. And you were on location in Spain? Uh, again, my part was done mostly on the back lot. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. And uh, what about Sinatra? What was your relationship with him? Very little, very little, because he was on the one end of the cannon and I was on the other. <laughs> Finally got killed by that cannon, I did. And Sophia? Ah, she was, she was delightful. We, had, uh, we, we used to have parties at Stanley Kramer's house and she would come and uh, she's a, what a gorgeous woman. What was Cary Grant like? Gentlemanly. British, and, uh, and fun. He had a, an impish sense of humor also. Brits tend to do that. <laughs> I love the British mm. sense of humor. Okay, I think mm. that'll do it. Uh, I